Steve Serfoss here, and we're in the middle of uh, commenting Hosea chapter 2, and just looking at how God deals with Israel there, with a the rebellious, stubborn Israel, uh, and see how that relates to, um, if that looks like God dealing with people who get to make their choices, and he wants to change the way they make choices, uh, if that's part of his dealing with them. And so we're down to the part where he said, you know, she's not my wife, she's an adulterer, I'm going to strip her bare, leave her in the desert, she's going to, I'm going to slay her with thirst. And verse 4, he says, I will not show my love to her children because they are children of adultery. So these are all the things that he's going to do, and they're external things. Okay, that's just the important thing, you know, the, the, the status. Um, they're external things to try through that change, and I think it's very clear in that passage, the way that Israel thinks about God. So God is um, working externally to change the way that Israel thinks. And he says, their mother has been unfaithful and has conceived them in disgrace. And so he's talking about the decisions, the choices that Israel has made. And she said, I will go after my lovers. And then we see the conception, I mean the idea that she has. I'll go after my lovers who give me my food and my water. There's not a recognition of God, but looking, oh, wow, these lovers are giving me all this. My wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. And, and again, part of this is uh, you know, a, 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 an example of adultery for spiritual, and a lot of this is idolatry. So Israel is praying to idols and say, oh wow, the idols gave me food, the idols gave me water, the idols gave me wool. And Jesus is saying, no, you're adulterer, and you've gone as a lover to these idols, and it's not that stuff that, that they're not the ones that have, your lovers have not given you, or your idols have not given you. Look at verse 6. This is a pretty important verse. Therefore I will block her path with thorn bushes. So here we have this Israel in a figure, I mean, again, how this all fits in, exactly what it means. I think it's clear what it means. It's got a spiritual sense. But this, this woman, this adulterous woman in this example and in this way of teaching has a desire to go a certain place. That is her thoughts. Her thoughts are in rebellion to God. Her decision is in rebellion to God. And God is not coming in and saying, I'm going to zap your heart, you know, and zap the way you think and just kind of click. No. But he says, I'm going to put a physical barrier. I'm going to block her path with thorn bushes. I will wall her in so she cannot find her way. How true that is with the judgments that God sent him off into captivity and so forth. He just physically blocked. Um, and, and sorry if I jump forward right now, but I look at the book of Revelation and when we have Armageddon and Jesus comes and the people of the world fight physically, a physical fight and war against God, is that not God letting man express his own rebellion to God, his own decision to, uh, to fight against God? Isn't it God giving him liberty to make those choices and take the consequences of those choices? Obviously, with God, with one word, he could zap and annihilate, annihilate uh, all mankind, all rebellious mankind there, but he lets him go out and do this. In this same way, this rebellious woman has this idea, she's going to go, I'm going to block her path with thorns bushes, an external thing. I will wall her in so she cannot find her way. She will chase after her lovers but not catch them. God is affecting what happens externally in her life, uh, not catch them. She will look for them but not find them. Okay. So God says by changing these, by intervening with these thorn bushes and blocking the way and not letting her find her lovers, then she will say, so God is saying, I'm going to do these external things to change what she would think, to change what she would say. Now, let me say that as we deal with people, I'm a married man, and sometimes uh, this go, goes both ways. Sometimes I have to convince my wife to do that we, it would be good and that she would really like to do something. Sometimes she has to come and convince me that this is something that we both really want to do. So, uh, but here we see God dealing with man, uh, Israel, rebellious Israel in this way. Could he deal differently? Yes, of course. Is he all-powerful? Yes, of course. Is our will zap nothing useless before him? Of course. But he chooses, 
And he expresses this to us this way in his word to work this way with rebellious Israel. So he says, by doing these external things, she has this thought in her mind. She wants to go that way. I'll put the thorn, uh, thorn bushes and block her way. That will change the way she thinks. Okay, now, true, that has not got her saved yet. But she begins to think, uh, then she will say, I will go back to my husband as at first. For then I was better off than now. She has not acknowledged that I was the one who gave her the grain, the new wine and oil, who lavished on her the silver and gold, which they used for Baal. It's almost tears of the comment saying, I've changed her thoughts a little bit, but still hasn't got right down to the core thoughts about who's giving her the gold, the silver, and the food, and the, the new wine and the oil, the grain, the new wine and the oil, okay? So it says, therefore I will take away my grain when it ripens and my new wine when it is ready. I will take back my wool and my linen intended to cover her nakedness. Now again, God could have miraculously gone down and touched her heart and, you know, oh wow, I love you, God, you know. But in, he's, let, he, he's letting these rebellious thoughts go there and he says, the way I'm gonna do it is I'm gonna go down and take away the stuff that she hasn't recognized that I'm giving her, all this physical provision. I'm going to take it away from her. So verse 10, he says, now, So now I will expose her lewdness before the eyes of her lovers. Uh, you know, using the example, the lovers that liked her, says no one will take her out of my hands. He's going to make her unattractive to the people who would come and want to take her in this example. That's, that's very interesting. Um, uh, maybe again, we could we could apply that a lot of ways. Um, but you know, obviously here, if the uh, if the lovers are the idolatry, the, and then behind the idol, uh, Paul says behind the idolatry is demons. So he's he is beginning to undo the work of the devil towards this person. I will stop all her celebrations, her yearly festivals, her new moons, her Sabbath days, and her appointed feast. I will ruin her vines and her fig trees, which she said were paid from her lovers. I will make them a thicket and wild animals will devour them. So again, he's working in the external world and the circumstances around. And the only way to understand this passage is he's doing that to change the perception and the way that she thinks. I will punish her for the days she burned incense to the bowels. She decked herself with rings and jewelry and went after her lovers. But me she forgot, declares the Lord. So again, he's not talking about nice, lovely people here that are really kind of a step away from, you know, really wanting to be a Christian. Okay, I realize we're in the Old Testament here, but I mean, just trying to express, it's not nice. These are people that forgot me. Now look at verse 14, and this is where, again, how do you describe the interaction between God and this woman? He says in verse 14, Therefore I am now going to allure her. I'm now going to allure her. I'm going to draw her to me. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. So first is it to, to convince and to change the way she thinks is the thorn bush blocking, taking away the material things. And then he says, now I'm going to allure her. I'm going to draw her. And he uses the words, really, again, the whole illustration here is a unfaithful woman and a husband. And so he uses the words of a man. How would a man try to draw a woman to her? I will try and allure her. I'll speak tenderly to her. So God is trying through all these external things to do something in the heart and in the mind and in the perception of Israel. This is what I say that man, God chose and chooses to work and let something grow up in us. Again, he's intervening all over the place. This is not happening without him. If he did not allure us, we would not be saved. All that's true. But the way he does it is through what we're feeling, what we're thinking in our hearts. I will lead her into the desert and I will speak tenderly to her. And he says, hey, I will give her back her vineyards. And, we'll make the, and, and so really he talks about the, the, the end times of salvation. He goes in here prophetic. I will give her back her vineyards and will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she will sing as in the days of her youth. Let me just stop. Rather than reading the rest of this, you can read the promises. But I, I can't, even though we're talking about man's choice and ability to choice and how God wants to affect those choices, I cannot stop but say, especially as a man, 
Could you love a woman who had been unfaithful to you? Could you love a woman who was literally a prostitute, who had all kinds of lovers and you knew it, who had children that were not your own? Could you love her? Yet here we see the love of God. In spite of all that, he says, I'm going to take you out in the desert. I'm going to allure you. I'm going to speak tenderly to you, and you're going to be my own. That's why we say, God has saved us. God bless you.